talk about the book of Job. The book of Job is uh, wisdom literature. All right, it's it's placed in the Bible right there uh, before uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and that's probably where it fits best. Yet it's not like Proverbs with all of its use of a uh, few words to convey a lot of information or meaning or advice or suggestions. No, it's not like that. It's not like Psalms or Song of Solomon's with poetic praise and petition and passion in the writing. No. Though you will find some poetry inside of Job, so what is it? Well, Job starts out like a fairy tale. Then it kind of reads like a documentary, like someone was interviewing these folks. And Job leaves us questioning throughout, did this all really happen? We might also question, does it matter? Or, because what's going on here in this odd, somewhat tenuous, kind of confusing book is all this stuff. And we just ask more and more questions. Like, why would anyone want a worship series on this book? Well, you guys are in luck because I did. Uh, so uh, that's good. Thank, thanks, Barb. Barb's all for it. So uh, one out of, okay, that's bad. Why would anyone want a worship series? Well, here's why. I think, in my opinion, the book of Job deals with some profoundly difficult questions in the life of faith. And it does so without easy answers and simple answers. In fact, Job takes on simplistic cliches with some painful truths about life in the real world. But I want to be honest. Job isn't really for those for whom everything is great and all your choices come up smelling like roses. It's not going to be the book for you. No, it's a book for those who have questions. Those who are struggling or suffering or feeling like there's no one listening. No one's out there at all. And if this is you or anyone you know, then the book of Job is the place for you. The human condition, my friend, seems rampant with difficulty. From birth to death, we seem to be born to trouble. And it's odd that the original title of this book in Hebrew is not the book of Job, no. No, but the word that it had was so, I, I just don't, I, mean, I didn't do well in Hebrew, so you have to forgive me. And even my computer couldn't seem to pronounce it in, the, in a way that I could say it. Because the word has a vowel, at the, a consonant at the start, four vowels, and then a consonant at the end. And two of the vowels were wise. So, no, I'm not going to try it. I'm not going to do it. But i got to tell you what it meant. The original Hebrew, and was also the title, uh, the book of Job is uh, from our uh, Latin Bibles. But the original title meant two things. It could mean persecuted one. The mean persecuted one. Or more likely, what they were trying to convey was that this is a story about a repentant one. The one who came back. That's what repentance is, is coming back. All right, The one who came back. The one who repented. And the basic question of the book of Job, if I took it all together... I've read it, you know, and we'll read parts of it over the next few weeks. But if I condensed it all to one big question, it would be, why do the righteous suffer if God is loving and all-powerful? Why? Now, I've got to tell you that I don't believe that the book is about suffering. But I would like us to focus as we go through this series on what Job learns from the suffering and ordeals he goes through. Many of us have experienced trouble in our lives and may even be in the midst of a time of trouble now. 
And Job may be an example with which can help us through our time of ordeal. So let's begin uh, with our reading today from Job. I'm going to start verse 1 on chapter 1. But then after I'm done with verse 1, I'm going to skip the rest of chapter 1 and go right to chapter 2 and read for a little bit. It's a pretty cool start to a book. There was once a man in the land of Uz. Uz is one of my favorite places, okay? Uh, if you attend a Wednesday night Bible study, you know I love cities that only have two letters in their name. Like Ur, that's where Abram left. Abram left Ur, you are. Well, Job lives in Uz. Another good spot. Because I think Indianapolis, when I lived there, was a long thing to write. Jacksonville, when I lived there, was a long thing to write. So I like the simple places. Don't know why there's not an Uz in Indiana. If there is, if you've been there, let me know. A man lived in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Chapter 2 starts this way. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited him, say incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and flesh and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he's in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a pot shirt and, uh, with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. i got to tell you, I like simple sermons. When I started writing this one, I wrote two words and I thought I was done. I said, this, this says it all. From our reading in Job, this says it all. Okay? So get ready. Here it is. Stuff happens. Stuff happens. I couldn't just stop there. Couldn't just stop there. But you know me, I like to hear myself. I think those two words encapsulate the theme of Job in this message. The simple truth is undeniable that in our lives stuff happens. Beginning of the book of Job is simply trying to establish that simple living in this world reality that stuff happens. I got to tell you, if you attend the Wednesday night uh, uh, Bible study, uh, you know that I love contextual analysis of the Bible. I love to do that. All right, I'll tear it up. Okay, and by contextual analysis, I want to know when the scripture was written. I want to know who it was written to, why it was written, what did it mean then when it was written to the people it was written to, and what could it mean for us today? Contextual analysis. I love that stuff. So I want to provide you with some insight into Job to help and broaden our understanding of this repentant one, the one who came back. I got this one book, and I love the intro to it. It's, it's pretty uh, great. Uh, Carol Newsom wrote it. 
It's a commentary of the text of Job, and I thought her introduction to it was really smart. She argues that the book of Job in our Bibles today is an evolution through what she identifies as four different stages of editorial theologizing about this puzzling book. So what we have today in our Bibles would be like the fourth edition. And every edition they had to add something or change something, right? Okay. She writes that the oldest one of the book only had the beginning, which we read from, the end, and a little bit in the middle. Would have been a whole lot shorter. I guess that one came out for Reader's Digest. But uh, she says, no, no laughing on that at all. Okay. Thank you, Barb. But it was late. <laughs> She states that the, that long poetic dialogue that's in the middle of it, which also went through three separate editions and makes up the bulk of the text we have today, was added later. But it was all designed, the whole book was designed to shift our understanding of the characters in the story and to elevate or reduce their status and to add complexity to the central issue of human suffering that this book contained. And you may be asking yourself or saying to yourself right now in your pews, gosh, Tim, need information, but what does it really matter? I know you're asking that because I've sat there too. I tell you, it matters in part because it shows us that this story is designed with a purpose. And that purpose is not just recording some obscure ancient historical event. Now what I'm not saying is that uh, Job was made up, no. That it's some invention of a series of unknown writers. No, actually what I'm saying is that to spend our time researching the historical context of Job is to miss the point that is presented in the book. The point of Job is that God is good and does love us. Yet there is suffering in the world. And there are people who have lost everything while there's still a God who loves us. And who is good? Now you're probably saying to yourself, of course there is, and of course there are. But my friends, that's what makes this book so compelling. It is real life. It's real life, and it asks real questions. It wrestles with the truth in humbling and transforming ways, even in redemptive ways. This story, you know, what I read, it begins like a fairy tale or a parable. Both are narrative events designed to teach us something. The question with Job is, what is it teaching? Is it teaching that God plays games with the universe? I mean, for me, verse 1, it seems to be a, a pretty obviously unreal setup. And I say this because... I don't think uh, anyone is really like this, blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. I say that because humans have failings. And it's always prevalent in life. We all fall short. We don't mean to, but we do. Yet, we're always striving, and we're evidence of it as we gather together. We're striving for that uprightness, for that rightness with God. We're striving to be blameless before God. But we are human. The whole point of the book of Job is that even if we could attain such a status of being blameless and upright, we would still not be immune from suffering. Random stuff happens. It does. Even the health-conscious person can succumb to an illness. Even the safety-conscious person can suffer from an unforeseen incident. There is, however, a mindset that's prevalent in our society and in some churches. A mindset that declares that faith protects. That the faithful earn a bubble around their lives that ensures nothing bad will happen to them. That's pretty prevalent. But that's also why so often those who are stricken, who suffer, abandon their faith because they believe some promise was not kept. That God broke his promise. 
They scream out, if God doesn't keep up God's end of the bargain, then why should I anymore? And so the thinking goes. But my friends, we know, we know that a life without suffering has never been promised. Read the Bible cover to cover. You'll find no such promise in it. None. Jesus actually said things would be worse for us if we did live a life like him. Because he says, you see how they treat me? They'll treat you the same way. They hung him on a cross after beating him nearly to death. <laughs> Face not some bargain in which we're guaranteed health and personal safety. And we're a, we're a safety conscious nation. Some would say we're obsessed with it. You come over to my house, several of you have been there, you'll notice on every single door there's a deadbolt. Now I will say, that's not to keep people out, that's so Patty won't leave. Alright? Y'all know that. Y'all know that. We're real safety conscious, right? It'd be great if we could have that kind of security. Our faith is our security. Yet stuff happens. It does. Now, if you were listening when I read the beginning passage from Job, you may be asking, wait a minute, this isn't random happening stuff. There is a purpose. There is interference. There is a Satan. That's the explanation for all our problems, all our struggles. There's a Satan. Well, the first thing to know about chapter 2 is that it isn't an explanation or an excuse it's, it's a furthering of the drama, the drama here, or rather the personification of the randomness of existence. Satan mentioned here isn't the adversary of God. This Satan that they mention is a holder of a position in God's court, in the heavenly court. Now quite often, the Bible will not say Satan, it will call this person the accuser. The accuser, all right? That seems a whole lot safer. And all this Satan does in our story of Job is simply raise a question or an opposition to God's boasting on the character of this human being called Job. Many Bible scholars interpret this role that this accuser, Satan, has is like a prosecuting attorney, okay? A part of the council of heaven, a partner, a co-worker with God. And his job is not to defend everything God says, it's to ask questions about it. So if there's, you know, our advocate in heaven is Jesus. So when God says, what about Tim Glenn? Jesus would say, I know him. And the accuser says, yeah, but does he lead a blameless and righteous life? Jesus says, forget it, I know him, Dad, bring him in. That's how, that's how you get it. But in our story, there's a conversation that begins, and God asks this simple question, where have you been? Hey, accuser, where have you been? And, uh, of course, this Satan, he replies, hanging out. Uh, of course, that's in the Bible that I'd write. I'd say hanging out, because that's what I like to say. Uh, but that's actually not what he said. Satan answered the Lord, saying, from going, I've been... We have been going from to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. Where have you been from going to and fro? To and fro. I've been just out and about, just here and there. I've been just part of the senior. I just blend in and watch what your creation does. And then I come back and I tell you. I tell you. Which means this is part of life. This is invitation. This is opportunity towards suffering. It's there. It's random. I'm sure you can decide uh, it's all in opposition to God, the Satan person, but it isn't. At least according to this wager, there's a wager that happens between God and Satan. And we do have to note that God is a participant in it. At the very least, allowing it. He's complicit in it. In all that befalls this blameless and upright, obedient servant of God. 
kind of makes you think. And I do think we should contemplate this. We should think about it. It's not just important. I think it's essential in our Christ-like lives to consider this. Job causes us to ask ourselves the question, why do I believe? Why do I believe? And what is my faith all about? That makes it a whole lot simpler, sort of, than saying, what's faith all about? What's my faith all about? That's the question you need to ask. These are the fundamental questions that hover in the text of Job. There are beneath the obvious ones about suffering, which are also crucial in these days of pandemic and hardship. But I want you to listen to me. I want to be clear about this. I want to share a truth with you. Job doesn't give us any easy answers. I'm not going to be able to tell you from reading Job and sharing with you in this series about Job why you believe. You have to answer that. I can't answer the question, what's your faith about? I can't tell you what it's about. You have to answer that question. There's not going to be some bumper sticker kind of faith hidden here. Instead, we're going to be invited to examine the depth of our souls and the foundations of what we believe. There's an underlying conviction that having waded through this book, one might be woven more tightly into the hope of the very kingdom of God. The transformation being offered in this book here is towards a faith that doesn't hang on external circumstances, but on inner convictions that we each hold true and dear to ourselves that seek to expand into profound and Christ-like relationships and practices. Our mission, my friends, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We need to go through the experience of wrestling with suffering, of wrestling with doubt, of questioning, and with anger, just like Job does. So we can share our experiences with others who are going through it themselves. That's an expression of love. Letting them know they're, they're not in this alone. This is how we cling to faith. Even as we live in this random world where stuff happens. And stuff happens, my friends. How we deal with it. While we're in the midst of suffering and following is an individual response. We'll be seen in God's eyes. God will see us. We'll be accused. Our job is to come through blameless and upright. And it will be hard. Will we be blameless and upright? That's a question to be answered. So we're going to start going through this book. And I pray you'll be open to these questions. And you'll ask yourself of them. Amen.